I give you Dr. John Henrik Clark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in the remarks that I'm going to give this evening, if I had a two semester course, it would be too short to do justice to the subject. While I'm addressing myself to eldership in the African world, the focal point of my attention will be on three neglected and comparatively recently passed elders. Sheikh Entadio, Chancellor Williams, and John Jackson. I maintain that our crisis all over the world is because we have neglected to listen to our finest messengers. We have neglected to listen to the African message of the 19th century when African elders realized that chattel slavery was being turned into a colonial system, another form of slavery, and when instead of negotiating and selling themselves for European trinkets, they went to the battlefield and fought Europe for a hundred years. I'm talking about the 19th century in the Caribbean islands when after the massive slave revolts throughout the Caribbean islands and throughout South America, especially Brazil, when they discovered the fakery of emancipation and in Jamaica and other places, they went back to the battlefield and started the revolts all over again. And in the United States, the period of Frederick Douglass, Samuel Ringo Ward, Henry Highland Garnett, Martin Delaney, David Walker's appeal, massive slave revolts, that first half of that 19th century and the agitation on the eve of the Civil War, then we come down to that second half of the 19th century. In Africa itself, agitation for independence, revolts after revolts. In the Caribbean islands, the fight for constitutional government in the United States, the fight for equal human beingness, the fight to build institutions. In South Africa, we have not heard great elders like Matthews who said, who's supposed to be a conservative, and said that you, for a people to be free, they must produce one sacrificial generation, and that's the foundation for all generations to come. We have not put that sacrificial generation ahead. We have a whole lot of ceremony and no substance. And if you understand what I'm talking about, you would understand that we are into another trick bag thinking the faker in South Africa was an election. You cannot have an election and become free when a foreigner owns 87% of your land, all of the wealth producing resources, control the entry and the exit to your land and you say you are free? You say you are free when you have to call a foreigner back to cure your child's stomachache? And when you get back what slavery and colonialism took away from you is a container called nation. <clears throat> and when you shout nation time, you have to remember have someone prepared to rule every aspect of that nation from the proper sweeping of the street to 
to the presidency, to the negotiation of treaties, to the management of harbors, to the curing of your child's stomachache, to the making of the locomotive that takes the food across your country, to making the safety pin to hold your child's diaper together. together. If you haven't done that, you're lying through your teeth about understanding nation and what we have lost, not listening to our elders, is the concept of nation. We have not listened to the night. What do you think David Walker was telling you? Generations grow up and not read David Walker's appeal. What do you think Clement Kadele was trying to say in the South African trade union movement? What do you think Kapalo Kagwa was trying to say in Uganda? And what do you think Martin Delaney was trying to say to you? We have not listened to our elders. We made a ceremony out of eldership. That if you made a ceremony out of eldership, what is it that Chancellor William died in a, almost a charity home, nursing home? John, he had saved his money correctly and he died broke. Why didn't somebody take care of this elder? Why did hustlers in Washington take up money in his name and put the money in their pocket? Why, you let them walk away scot-free. Are we lying through our teeth about taking care of elders? Who are you kidding? John Jackson made money, had a pension, Social Security, a little royalties from his books. Why did we have to take up a collection to bury him? If you were taking care of your elders, why wasn't he at least buried in style? He gave us some great literature on the influence of religion on history. Why have you read his books? Especially Christianity Before Christ. Dare you read his book, Christianity Before Christ. You think this fakery you call Christianity is a religion. It's a political instrument concocted by, at the conference at Nicaea to rationalize European domination of the world, including the domination over your mind. Now, if you listen to John Jackson, have you listened to Elder, you would understood that had you read Dr. Ben's books on the, the our African origin of the three major religions, you would know that already. No one could fake you on religion had you read the religious literature written by your elders. I'm saying that I'm here to scold you for neglecting your elders. You have not read Chancellor Williams. You've not read him well. You possess his books, but you don't read his books. If you had read his books, The Destruction of Black Civilization, just read that third chapter, Ethiopia, I mean, Egypt, Ethiopia's oldest daughter. You wouldn't be debating anybody, with anybody about whether Egypt was black or white. Even if you read a book by a white, Gerald Massey, you wouldn't be debating that. And if you read Dr. Ben's Black Man of the Nile and his family, you wouldn't get into no debate of what either was black or white. You sure will think you're created it, because if you know the chronology of history, you know there was no Europe at the time. Why have not we listened? Why haven't we, we talk about Garveyism? We haven't even read Garvey's African fundamentalism. We had the greatest opportunity from 1954 with the emergence of Ghana in the two decades that followed. We had an opportunity to pull African people together and unify them, not to conquer other people's country, but to claim that which belongs to them. We threw it away with nonsense, arguing over nothing. Malcolm X was killed right in front of our eyes. We betrayed the promise of our great elders. 
Johnson Williams laid out a plan for our world re-emergence in, in two books, The Rebirth of African Civilization and The Destruction of African Civilization. Most of you hadn't even read it. Won't somebody give us a book, give us an idea, give us a program. God damn it, people have been giving you a program for 200 years. You haven't even paid them the respect of even reading it. So what do you think we have lived for? We have the right to come and scold you. You've wasted our precious life by not making the best use of what we could have done. I have said before, I never met a rich man who had a better mind than me. So if I wanted to be rich, I could have been rich. Dr. Ben could have been a high paid engineer or something else if he wanted to be. He could have gone down the Cadillac route. He ain't rich. What do you think he lived on short rations and, and, and unpaid lecture fees sometime to get a message across to you? Our life has been a love affair. And if we are angry, we are angry because we don't like the way you've appreciated our love. We didn't ask you to give us any Rolls Royce. We don't need no damn stretch limousines. We don't need no $500 suits. We ask for the basic things in life. A little space to do our writing. Decent food, a doctor when we need it. We don't need a string of women. One at a time is enough. <laughs> We're reasonable. <laughs> now back to Shekhar de Dio. Shekhar de Dio, for all of what we can criticize him for, place in proper focus. The world dimensions of African history in his books, African Origins of Civilization, Myth of Reality, and in his last magnum opus, African me, Civilization of Barbarism. And in his work, Africa, the Politics of a Federated State. He laid out a plan for preserving the history of Africa, and preserving the resources for African people. You are never going to be free and you dare not call yourself nation until you can preserve and manage the wealth producing resources of the nations of Africa and unify African people across all geography and all cultural boundaries. We must stop this nonsense about arguing about whether slave ships put us down. The common denominator is where the slave ship took us from. Who gives a damn who's from the Caribbean island, who's from Georgia, and who's from Alabama, and who's from Africa? A white bigot could care less. You got a black face, he hates all of you. Malcolm X tried to tell you this. He tried to deal with the land question in his message to the grassroots. John Jackson tried to tell you, he didn't tell you to leave Christianity. He tell you the one that you, that's been fostered on you is a fake. He said, conceptualize it and use it for your own sake. It's an, it's an old story, retold and resold to you. He studied, telling to study the North African church. Christianity entered Europe directly from the North African church and it returned to Africa after the conference in Nicaea 
a crippled African child being sold to Africa as something perfect. And because we have not listened to our elders, we have not listened to our writers, we get hung up with myths and suppositions and children come to you, give me a program, tell me the book to read. There is no the book on any subject in the world. There's several books that will get you started to reading the subject. I've known to read 10 books just to give a lecture and 20 to give a course. Let me see if I can finalize what I'm trying to say to you. You had the greatest opportunity of any people in history. You did not take the best, did not make the best use of it. You could have unified Africa. The African in the West with his knowledge of basic technology could have industrialized Africa. He could have militarized Africa. The African has always been hospitable to strangers, the wrong strangers. No one has come into Africa to do African people any good. Africa is now the milk cow, not only of the Western world, but the Arabs in the Eastern world also. Black people join a religion and declare war on other black people for, asking, for raising a question. And if you understood the nature of religion as the imperial arm of conquerors, all of them, no exception, include the Hindu faith, include all of them, all brought into, brought into countries by foreigners and fakers and fools. You think I'm against God? No. I want to remove the garbage and the debris so you can see the real face of God and feel the God inside of yourself and the strength inside of yourself. I'm saying turn to yourself and your finest messages before it is too late. Don't tell me you are a Garveyite if you haven't read Garvey's African Fundamentalism. Don't tell me you're a fan of Dr. Ben if you haven't read Black Man of the Nile his books on African religion, and another neglected work which should be read and reread, Black Theologians Without a Black Theology. Don't express your admiration for him when I have seen none of his books in your hand and when you talk None of the knowledge he put in the book is reflected in your mind. Your friendship is as worthless as thin air if you hadn't paid him that tribute. You didn't get to know John Jackson. You've been richer for it. And when you read Sheikh Antadio, the depth and perception, read his fine essay, African Contribution to Civilization, The Exact Sciences. Read it to your children when they say mathematics is hard. Look boy, we invented it. 
It must have been hard for those Africans who put up the pyramids and all those temples because they didn't have algebra and all those things around. They didn't have it by name. They probably had it, had to have it. They just didn't have it under that name. Well, it's been hard for them too. Less difficult with you with all your computers and I don't accept no excuse from you. We have not given our you great expectations because we have not accepted great expectations within ourselves. You think because I have come here tonight getting old and terribly angry that I do not hold you dear. There are many roads I could have walked down other than devote my entire life to African liberation, to research, and to proving it, and to causes. If you did not mean that much to me, if you wasn't part of the totality of what I call my family in the world, I could have gone down another route instead of doing this. And I have asked for no great riches, having done so. A little space in the world to do my books, a little quietness, some time without aggravation, proper pay for the work I did, and I'm putting the wood into work for, for my, my keeps, my bread and tea. Ask you to appreciate yourself and look at your great potential. Stop accepting the word minority, but you were never a minority. That's what that conference is about in Egypt. Toning you down. That's part of what AIDS is about. You can debate that yourself. I've had my debate. What I want to say in the final analysis is that people who have made a mission out of trying to preserve your history, your culture, your politics, and moving some of the rocks out of the past so that another generation can walk smoothly needs some consideration. We need to look at Booker Washington again, see what he said that we could use. And remember, he shuffled so we wouldn't have to shuffle. He said yes, so that another generation could say, hell no. The best way a man can tell a people that you are my family, you're the thing dearest to me, you're part of my commitment, you're part of the thing I love better than anything in, in all the world, is to commit his life in a struggle for that betterment. I have not done it as well as I wanted to do, but I have done it the best way I could, given my circumstances. And when I leave you, that's all I can leave you. Thank you. Once again, we have proof that those who truly love us will always tell us the truth, whether we like it or not. They will put us on the path and give us a loving shove to move down that path. They will not let us let up. They will point the way and they will extend a hand. But they are always clear.
about what we need to do. The next wise elder is also internationally famous, world famous historian, prolific writer, and I have a special personal thing to say about Dr. Yosef Benyekinen. My trip to Kemet came with Dr. Ben. I was sitting in my office one day, wasn't even thinking about Kemet, wasn't on my mind, had no inclination or inkling to go there. And I opened a piece of mail and almost tossed it. And I saw Dr. Ben's picture and this trip about Egypt. And something told me not to put the paper down until I picked up the phone and called and made the reservation. And going to Kemet with Dr. Ben was not a vacation. He let us know that this is a study tour. And he worked us, he worked us, took us out and toured and came back. We had to sit and learn what we had seen and what we were going to see the next day, free of anybody who might distort the truth. He wanted us to hear it directly from him. And I can remember very vividly that Dr. Ben got us up before dawn on New Year's Day, 1987, to go to the pyramids because he didn't want a crowd of people in there when we experienced the energy in the pyramid. And a large part of the reason that I wrote Pyramids of Power is because the message to do that changed my life was because of this man who sits on the stage. So without further delay, I give you Dr. Yosef Ben Yakima. I will start by saying good evening. Yesterday, it was my bad misfortune to have to go to Raleigh, North Carolina again. Why it was my misfortune? I passed by a school that I taught at for nothing, just transportation, for two years while I was working at Cornell. I'm talking about Shaw University. Of course, we were let go when President Archie Hargreaves was fired for bringing too many independent ideas to the campus. But yesterday, what made me so angry, I passed where Shaw is billing a $5 million building for the residents of its male students. They wasn't one, I repeat. Before I repeat it, just let me quickly say, Shaw is a school that Stokely Carl Michael came from that sat down in front or at the stool of the um, super, this super business place, Woolworth, and led the picket line, the sit-down strike. And Shaw didn't have one black man working on its five million dollar men's residence. Mm -hmm. Not one. Mm -hmm. In speaking about it, to the gentleman who brought me to speak at the center after leaving Chapel Hill, I was informed that three years ago at St. Augustine, they built three buildings and only five black men work on any of those three buildings. And these are two black schools, they told me. I brought this to start because after Martin Luther King, and I'm going to say that is supposed to change the world, and especially America, and that the black alumni 
who goes all the way around and week before that sitting in Pan Pan restaurant a minister who was on the board at Shaw University came in to that store requesting donation from the owner towards Shaw University. I went around the campus at Shaw and found that they had a big Islamic center and that every department in Shaw dealing with science, mathematics was headed by either someone from Iran or Arabia. And I asked the question, aren't there any professor, African professor who knows science, who teaches science and mathematics and all those things? And the answer came back, yes, but they don't have money to contribute to the school. I think that's a good point in which I could start from because like Professor Clark, I reflect back and when we met way back there in the old Schomburg library, the day I could see it as clear as day that when we met and we had our strike of our conversation and the things we said then, we had been looking at men like Huggins and Seifert and a whole lot of them, even Rogers and so forth. Men with deep ideas about their people and where their people going. And even when we differ with each other at certain points, we were different in honesty and reality and sincerity. I don't find that today. I find organizations, our organizations with such things as elders council. But no meeting for the elders, no decisions for the elders to make. And then we are expected to go along once a year as window dressing. Sit down for others to see us and feel good because we have taken out the mart ball, brushed off and brought forward and say, here are the elders and dress us up with Kenty cloth and we are all right. Some years ago, I spoke at a conference in Los Angeles and we had asked the issue, what's right with the race? What is it with the race? And I start out in my simple way and I said the race is fucked up. I repeat that again tonight. I repeat it again tonight when, when you can find that men and women calling themselves a black caucus will encourage the United States to go into Haiti and drop bombs regardless of what the issue, who is right or who is wrong. Those, those little puppets calling themselves black caucus, and that goes for everyone bar none, have not asked the United States to go in to Sarajevo to drop, to even use a matchstick. They have not asked at all to go anywhere in the former Yugoslavia to take any action. But they asked the United States to go in and did encourage and then went in in Grenada. They did go in in Panama. Now they want to go back to Haiti for the third time. To kill more African people regardless of who's wrong. And the issue is the general in Haiti that bad or worse than Aristide? Is it, is it worse to be the general in Haiti than the puppet for the Pope? Those Haitians who are asking that they come in to get to, to put Aristide back 
must think that Haiti has never had an opportunity to rule itself and the United States doesn't have to attack Haiti. It controls the finance belonging to Haiti. Every penny in American banks belonging to Haiti has been held as they had done to Iran when the Shah was being supported by the United States. Again, we have read the Berlin Treaty, Berlin Act, the Brussels Treaty, the, Berlin, the Brussels Act, the League of Nations and now the United Nations, our organization all crack around. It makes no difference. And what we can see, there is no difference between the mosque, the church, the synagogue, and Washington, D.C. They're all the same person. This new world order that they're speaking about, which they were taking place in Cairo, the European is frightened because take Italy. Italy already has a minus population. There are more Italians dying than being born. I am not complaining, I'm happy. Because it means that less white folks we got to fight. There's something that we're dealing with melanin here. And like I said before, to Brother Richard, I said, Brother Richard, yes, deal with Egypt and melanin. But it didn't start there, and it isn't going to end there. A month and a half ago, we went to a place where it didn't start, but the concept was used even more so than in Egypt. And that's what I said, one of the things we do. We run away with a thing and we go helter-skelter without asking whatever you get hold of it. I said to them, come and study Egypt. I've always said to them, but Egypt is at the end of the Nile where it ended, not where it began. About a month and a half ago, I took 11 brothers to the pyramids of Meroe. Seven hours straight deep into the bowels of the Sudanese desert. No trees, no anything around. And went up in the circle of the pyramids. And if you want to see, if you want to get an experience of what the African brothers and sisters did with, with the concept of melanin, come there. Come prepared to sweat, however. Come prepared for 125, 130 in the shade. And there is no shade. Except the four-wheel drive that you're using. And then you will see what the brothers placed on the pyramids there. But no, most of us stop. Some of us stop and say, we are the high priests. We know more than the ancient Egyptian high priests. Because they believe that there in Egypt is where it began, and there in Egypt, if you capture that, you have captured it all. They have seen nothing. They must not only come to Meroe, but you also got to go to Rooney. There are another set of pyramids there, and another set of tombs. When you come there and see how the pharaohs, not only the pharaohs of those days, but how the high priests and others were bed, buried in the fetus position. And see what they place in the graves, reminding us of what we are trying to do these days in terms of our blackness and why our blackness is unique and not only because of the sun. Of course, they dealt with their pictures, they showed us pictures just as they showed us 
God, men and Geddes moot in the position of reproduction. And we haven't dealt with this yet. We haven't dealt with the African woman of the mother of the world. We haven't dealt with her as heaven. Again, I'm going to come back in my means of crazy way of speaking, which many people can't understand. We haven't dealt with the black woman as heaven. And we haven't recognized that heaven is between her legs. We are thinking on the heaven that I'm speaking about is the sexual heaven. Yes, that has a part to do with it, but that's the minor aspect of what I'm talking about. The Pharaoh Pepe, the second, is the first that said this and put it down in writing where we are looking for melanin, where we are looking for the ureus. We're looking up here alone. Up here is where the symbol came to tell you so that you can see from a distance, but it's down here in the black woman where heaven is. You're looking for the earth because you're seeing the snake eyes. That's the outer symbols. But when you go in the tombs of the pharaohs, it isn't at the head you see goddess Nut. You see God, the God of the world, God Ra shown coming from the African woman. And when God rock comes out, God rock comes out of a black hole. Shining in rays. In a little chapel in a place called Dendera. Many of you who here have gone, I've carried you there to Dendera and showed you. You see God rock coming through the body of the sister, Goddess Nut, emerging from the sister with the light rays, the light rays shining on Goddess Hetheru, which others call Hathor. And Goddess Hathor holding in her hand the tree of life, smiling. No sin connected to the tree of life. No games God playing with the people born from the tree of life, asking them, Adam, Adam and Eve, where art thou? If you're big time God, you must know where they are, you're asking where art thou? <laughs> no. It is still another new day, another new day. Not a new day, another. We have had so many new days because we have not dealt with the first new day. We are still waiting for an approval for the European to say you are doing it correctly. I know that people say Ben Johanan writes so difficultly, so difficultly. I can't understand it. It's too complicated. It isn't Ben Yekanan fault, it's your fault that you haven't learned punctuation. I went to man's school and they taught me punctuation. So I could write one sentence, a whole book. It's your problem that you, your mind can't follow it. And I'm, I'm, an, old, I'm an old man with my, my, my cells that they came, and I have no problem following a, 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 a sentence with 15 lines. <laughs> as long as my punctuation is correct, then it is correct. And you should have no difficulty. How are you going to have a difficulty? And you're teaching a big white man college. And got all the degrees behind your name. No, and I'm not going to change. And I'm not going to stop eating pork chop either. I wrote all my books eating pork chop. Some days I had a pork chop in one hand. And the, and the next hand, and the typewriter. And the chop didn't mess up with my mind. Some of you didn't use no chop, and you didn't do nothing. Leave me my chop, because think better with the chop, anyhow. And let's talk about it more. 
I go on the campus and still there are meetings upon meetings. Black women having a meeting here. Black men having a meeting here talking about why black men ain't no good. Why black women ain't no good. We don't need no such damn stupid meetings. We need meeting with black women and black men together. Talking to each other about what the problems are. Coming up with solutions rather than one group here being woman liberated, next group or being faggot liberated, and all kind of different things. We have got to come and realize that the focal point of our people is the family. And you're not going to have the family with woman going with woman and man going with man. And let nobody make you feel guilty. And you're backing up. Somebody say, you faggot bashing or gay bashing. I don't gay bash, I faggot bash. And I'm butch bash. I don't give a damn who don't like it. Because I am interested in the African family. What good is a melanin conference if we come for a conference to discuss and the result is no family? The family is the core of the African people. Without the family and the concentration of the family, we have nothing and got no need to be here. And if we're not working towards the family, of a you, you as a unit as salvation, and I don't mean salvation people up in the air, salvation as our common destiny as an African people. And in so doing, we need some conferences on the sacredness of the African woman. The first thing I did came back here about uh, a month ago, as I dropped to the airport, a brother met me. What do you think about Sim uh, uh, Simpson? I said, I don't think about the jackass. I don't think about it. I got no time to wait. Let him hang the bastard. <laughs> what do I want with a man who did the most he can to be other than a black man? What would I want with a man that le left a sister at her deepest moment of despair when her child drunk, his child, and then he leave and go to a black hole, I mean a white hole, a white nothing, a white piece of trash, and set up her entire family and try to be as white as possible. At least Michael Jackson had the courage to come white. Michael wanted to be, and he went there. And now he's white. And everybody's wondering, Michael is a white man, leave him alone. You see, we lying, we lying to ourselves. Here's a man that gone white and we ask him, please stay home. Diana Ross, Michael, all of them, let them go. You got too many black brothers and sisters who needs your help than to waste time and those nothing. It is time that we start to really, I mean, we've been saying that all the time. Leaders come and leaders go and we're saying it is time that we do this again. We went through the whole thing about what time is it? It's nation building time. And we're still saying what time is it? and don't have the end in the word nation, much less the nation. No, it hurts. It hurts because we too are in the economic game. Brothers and sisters come to Africa leading groups, and especially to down the Nile. Leading groups. But they leave nothing in the Nile. Brothers and sisters come to the Nile, some of them with integrated groups. I could see you bringing an integrated group if your class from the university is coming, you get no choice. But when it's your private group, you do have a choice. And if you bring the crackers because you're cra you got cracker writers. <laughs> Brothers and sisters come in the Nile, 
and don't make an association with anybody in the Nile. No Nubian, no Egyptian, no Sudanese can't even give you the address of one unless it's a retail store where they're going to get some profit from the kickback. Now let's tell it like it is. Mama used to say, if you're going to shit, get off the park. No, I, you all don't like my Greek, but that's, that's the way I say it without the letters. You see, we've got to stop jiving with each other and making this a game. It is a game when up to now, every time I speak about we getting in a position to protect ourselves physically, I always get the reaction, but the man got all the guns and he got all what he going to do. We got guns. I just heard last, this morning about these six brothers who shot brothers and some sisters. We got guns. We got guns, but we don't have sight. We don't see white because we can't kill white. Because white is the way our God looks. And when we see Mr. Cracker in the White House, we see Jesus simultaneously. So when we come here to the melanin and we talk of black, we are still looking to find an excuse as to where blackness is. We are still fighting about if we are Afro or Afri. Mr. Mr. Gates said, let us go back to colored. He wants to be colored, colored. And we still could find salvation in Mandela and his aberrations. Mandela, who could not pay honor and respect for heaven, a heaven that stood by his sick behind, she should have given him some poison in jail. It isn't too late, Winnie. It's not too late. He deserves arsenic or something a little worse. <coughs> And we run around with a black face in the holy place. Running about Mandela is free. Never been free. What is he in charge of? He's in charge of the army, the navy, mines. He's, uh, he, he, he's not in charge of the chauffeur. <laughs> that comes from the pool. <laughs> The, the chauffeur comes from the chauffeur pool. Even the chauffeur can't tell. It comes, the chauffeur is told, go pick up Mandela, carry him here to here to here. But the chauffeur is a fool. One of these days where you don't jump out, let the car go where it's supposed to go. <laughs> it must be a lake someplace in South Africa that didn't dry up yet and let him go where he should go and let, let Winnie be the one to send him and, and bury him. No, it's about time that we stop chucking and jiving about Leadership, jive leadership. Now everybody talking about, I heard all these great black writers and uh, 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 planners of our future now talking about what? Multi what? Multicultural. And nobody black anymore. We gone multicultural. And everybody's remembering his black, his white great grandfather. <laughs> Hamilton had a a white grandmother and a, 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 a black grandmother and a white grandfather and because he liked it so good he went white to the extent that you could hardly find anything about him because he wanted to be white that bad until Burr told him what it was what he won't get for being white and give it to him. And more, a lot of us need to get what Hamilton got. Because we can't get our mind out of the European. We're still talking my school. 
How did you get my school? When I've been a colonel, they wouldn't tell me about my school, our school. I said, no man, I ain't got no school. I get a check every two weeks. And that check don't have my name anywhere in the front, it's on the back. Just before I get some money for the check. So in my school, it is the school. And we have to understand that goes with everything. So when we deliver on melanin, remember that we cannot stay in Egypt alone. Because who never told us where we must go. We must go to the land where extermination was arranged by the French, the Americans, the German and others. With the struggle between the Hutu and the Tutsi. We saw this coming and when we told them at the trusteeship council, Honest Calibala and myself, I cannot forget it, when I was at the United Nations, the reason we walked out and quit our jobs with no other job to do is over the issue of the necessity for the rearrangement of the borderlines between countries that they had to be removed, re replaced to suit the ethnic groups as what that meant, and more the national groupings. And we told them they had prepared the Hutu, made Roman Catholic primary out of them, but ignore the Tutsi, because they had discounted the Tutsi number one of being African. Couldn't tell us where they came from, but they, they, they said it was somebody different, they belonged to King Solomon mine. Knowing that culturally these two people have never lived together. We got an operation that constantly say that all Africans got to be united together into one government. All Africans have to have a United Nation or be like the United States with 48 states or 50 states or whatever it is. The United States isn't united. They have an agreement, a convenient agreement, but there's nothing united about it. It's united, they're going to kill black folks. And that's about the only thing they're united on. But we have to understand that the Berlin Treaty and Berlin Act and all of those, the Brussels and other things, was to make sure that the European control, and Bush said it just before he left office, they need a new world order. But they don't need a new world order. They need a new a rearrangement of the current world run by Europeans and European Americans. And getting down to the end, as we go back at the temple of goddess Hetheru at Dendera, not only in that chapel next to the Holy of Holies where goddess Nut is shown, Passing the deepest black dot out of which come God Ra. But as we go upstairs on the second floor into the very low ceiling room, there we see Goddess Mut hands out, completely exposed as we see God Mim in terms of fertility. Let us go back and understand that the black dot we were talking about is also one that centers direct in the umbilical cord. Right, you call it the belly button. It is a black dot. Go check it out again and see if you don't have a black dot. Is it just a dot in one place you look at the ureus or the head? That black dot is the extension of life. It is there that the ancient Africans along the Nile show you the penis of God, of God men coming out of, not from the cut, the extension of the umbilical cord. That equally is the black dot. I have been with my mother many times as a midwife, watching her as she deals with that black dot, as she ties that knot, as she sets that baby on straight, pushes it in, and sometimes tape it down, and then deal with the mother. So when we deal with the melanin, let us deal with it philosophically, 
theosophically and physically. But deal with it as a whole, as the ancient people along the Nile did. Not compartmentalize. Like when you go to the doctor and you got a cut on your leg, and he says, I'm sorry, you got to go down the street. I'm not a leg doctor. I deal with hands. And then you go to the next doctor, he, he can't do nothing because he deals only with jawbone. He's a jawbone doctor. And he went to a medical school and studied the whole human body. But now he's an invalid. He, can only, he can't help you. You've got to die. If you didn't specialize in jawbone or knee bone. Sounds like the old uh, spiritual in the church. Not even spiritual. Uh, the, the, the neck bone connected to some bone or the other and so forth. And we're back to that stage again. To stage one when we should be in stage three or stage four or somewhere else. Let us move this to an international forum. Let us make contact with brothers and sisters all over the world. Let us stop getting in our high house believing we are the Africans of all Africans and the Africans everywhere need us. Nobody will need a guy sitting on his boy and doing nothing. Nobody need a man praying, begging for something to fall in his lap. Getting up all the time. We need to organize. Hell, you know what needs to be done? Do it. And somebody would follow you. Rather than all the time begging somebody, let's do it. Do it. You know, you have the idea. Go out and do it. You and your woman do it. I say, my brothers and sisters, until we get to the point to worship, to worship, to worship, all black women. I gotta repeat that again. You're worshiping the wrong thing. You're worshiping Jesus. You're worshiping Jehovah. You're worshiping Allah. And the woman that taking care of your dirty behind, feeding you, clothing you, taking care of you, you ain't worshiping her. She got your children, you ain't worshiping her. You got heaven. And you're looking up at the air for heaven and got her right in the bed with you. Don't know what the hell to do with her. And you're worshiping her. You know what to do with her. You whip her behind for breakfast and inner. You stab her, you kick her when she's pregnant. And now you're mad. Because she too now start getting the white man. Because we didn't do our business. I'm, I'm not going to say we. Because sisters know I take care of business. And I preach. I preach and I praise black women. I praise them on my knee. The only time I go down on my knee is to praise a black woman and I ain't going for nothing else. At my, knee, at my age, the knee is too rough. I got to go side saddle. You know, no knee. No, but I let you know. We must leave this conference relating melanin to its source of origin. The black birth. The black child. The black womb. The heaven between our African mother's legs. The elders have spoken. And as the folks in the congregation said, well, <laughs> We know what to do. Is Dr. Leonard Jeffries in the house. While someone is bringing Dr. Jeffries forward, perhaps we can take a question or a comment. There's a mic in this aisle over here. And someone let Dr. Jeffries know that he is on. Is there a question of, of the elders from anybody? 
I know that's a hard act to follow. I don't blame you. <laughs> I heard a question from the audience. They didn't go to the mic. Well, Coming on Barry. Yeah, he, Dr. Clark heard it. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll come in on Barry. All right. Go. Is the mic here? Yes, sir. Yeah, you got it. I think it is singularly unfortunate that in the administrative city of the United States, but we supposed to put our best foot forward, we couldn't do better than send forward a person like Barry, a civil rights pimp, hustler, an articulate faker, unworthy of us at this critical juncture in our history, we should send better caliber people forward and if those better caliber people are not ready to come forward, then we've done something wrong if we don't have better offerings. It says something about the organization of the mind of the people who need to be served. I knew Barry in the Civil Rights Movement and known him since then. You don't bring the street into public office. I am concerned for the working class because that's the class that produced me. My people were sharecroppers down in Alabama. I don't bring the worst mannerisms the characteristics of that class. I try to prove to that class that it has aspirations, that it can behave in a manner that proves that they are worthy of power, that they can handle power correctly, and they can relate to all classes. I think Barra's election at this juncture in our history says something about our political naivete and our inability to, to spot and train caliber people for public office and to send them forth to serve as our messengers and not as people washing their ego at our expense. I'm saying this because other people are not going to say it. I'm just old enough and secure enough not to give a damn if you don't like what I said. Okay, we have a, we have a brother to Mike. Uh, yes, greetings brothers. Uh, salutations to the elders. I want you to speak, if you can, um, on the underlying reasons why the United States decided to go into Haiti. For who? Uh, the United States is going into Haiti as to why the underlying reasons why they are going into Haiti um, and uh, I believe that the history of Haiti uh, with the, the spirit of Toussaint the Overture and what he has done in the past I feel this is some kind of um, vengeance look to... uh, alright I got the point okay America owns Haiti when well, you gonna go into Haiti to spank a misbehaving child was misbehaving because you permitted him to do so and gave him the signal that he could get away with it. America did not want the example of a once slave state to exist in this hemisphere, so they began a war against Haiti from the beginning. America didn't want a communist state to exist on this hemisphere, so they began a war against Castro from the beginning. The circumstances that make them think twice before invading Cuba. Besides, they tried it once and got the tails beat. America owes Haiti something that black America hadn't even reminded America hmm. of. Treaty. Three Haitians, Toussaint, Dessalines, and Christophe stood up against that idiot Napoleon, and I mean what I said, 
stop him from using Haiti to establish a jumping point for America and force them to spend so much money and so much equipment and, and the soldiers America had to sell the Louisiana Territory. Three black men change the geography of the United States. It's not noted in your history, but it's a historical fact. Haiti was an example of revolution. We need to examine the revolution, it's especially to Santa Louverture, who was somewhat conservative, who really wanted to be a part of France. He wanted to pay a price to be a part of France that would, that would have literally brought Haiti back under French domination. I think if Toussaint and Louverture lived, had have lived, Toussaint and Louverture and Jesse Jackson would have been too much different. Jesse Lane was the real revolutionist. Christophe was the street radical of that day. But Haiti was that nation. Had Haiti and Liberia succeeded, the whole African world would have been much different. But America made a special point of making sure that Haiti and Liberia didn't succeed. National City Bank lent Haiti so much money, Haiti can't even pay the uh, interest, let alone the principal. America had to invade Haiti, and all America had to send a message and tell her lackeys. Behave yourself, I'll spank your tail, or take your alliance. Dr. Ben might have something to say about it, but I have nothing else to say about it. It's, it's a job invasion. It's like the invasion of Grenada was totally unnecessary. Grenada didn't even have 12 good guns. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the Grenadian Navy, Navy was an old boat. <laughs> yeah. and, you... and the Air Force was a Cessna. Didn't even have a good fishing boat. <laughs> the, the Come on, out, it's a joke. They brought out the Air Force and it was a Cessna with a guy holding a shotgun. <laughs> now, uh, we know it is typical that the place in the United States decide to attack militarily that can't possibly win were the places that she equally set up. Oriega in Panama. They even got Orega violating an American law while he is in Panama. <laughs> if you have a sovereign state and you want to change that state to a fascist state, that is your right as a sovereign nation. If your people don't want it, then they deal with you. America got no right in whether or not a state is quote unquote democratic or not. America isn't democratic, it's a republican nation. This nonsense about the Monroe law, who tell, told James Monroe that he was in charge of this part of the world, it's the same thing like the Pope in Rome did when he gave one half of the world, the western world to Spain, and the eastern half to Portugal. Who the hell gave the Pope a, a world to divide? Who the hell gave Carter? Car, uh, um, we don't make the difference. Carter or, or Clinton or, or, or Lincoln or Jefferson. I mean the same thing. Who gave him the right to decide? The same thing they had done. If they got a history of it. When, when Spain was being chastised by her colony Cuba, when General um, Gomez left from Santo Domingo and went over and helped Marti and all of them, and again um, was defeating Spain, when Aguinaldo in the Philippines was whipping Spain, America went and sunk her own battleship, the Maine, in order to cause a war. It's just a few years ago they admitted when they raised the battleship that the, the damage was from within. They knew that they had sunk their own battleship to get in the war. America divided Colombia into two countries and created Panama to control this, the Panama Canal. It's nothing new. And America went into Mexico. America took 
part of her is Mexico. Los California doesn't belong to the crackers from Europe. Texas, Texas doesn't belong to the crackers. So the, we, could, we, sh we should not give any excitement about surprise. See, I am never surprised of the bad things a European is going to do. I'm surprised when he does something good. If a European, I, I came down on the train, and I was a little late getting on the train, and the, I had to sit down with one of them. They had no other free seat. And I spread out my book, and the, he started and opening the, 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 the thing there for the train for me to put the book, and even moving the tape, my correction tape. When I said thank you, I had a watch good to see if it wasn't Michael Jackson. Because I know they don't do nothing for me. And maybe Mike, I said, well, Mike's little blackness must be come back to his mind. It ain't showing in his body, but it wasn't Mike after all. Because he was there with Presley's little girl. So, but, yeah, America's behavior cannot be surprising at this late date. America set up Harvey Firestone to go into Liberia and took over the Liberian Customs Department, controlled the money. They never allowed any black country to progress. When, I, that's why I don't vote anymore. And you all can say, what do you, I don't give a damn. I don't vote. That's why I don't worry about Barry or none of them. I don't give a damn what they do. I am dealing with getting rid of crackers. I'm not worrying about being with crackers. Now, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, with a war with Italy and Ethiopia, when black people left here to go to help Ethiopia, Franklin Delano Roosevelt placed an embargo on Ethiopia. None in Italy. Franklin Delano Roosevelt and that sick queen of, and the king of England send them sell Ethiopia dumb dumb bullets. That when they pull the trigger, it go pop and nothing happened. So I am never surprised. How can you surprise of a country that removed the shuttle from your body but maintain it on your brain? Okay, Dr. Jeffries is here and ready to go, so we won't be able to take any more questions at this point. We're going to ask Dr. Let's give Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark another hand.